Hello everyone and welcome to the cyst of jaws and oral soft tissue part 2 of the lecture. So in today's uh, lecture, online lecture, uh, the second important cyst which is the odontogenic keratocyst. So odontogenic keratocyst is a developmental cyst if you can recall from the previous lecture where we had discussed the classification. Uh, there are two types of cysts uh, in the jaws we have developmental and we have inflammatory under developmental last time we discussed dentigerous cyst and this time we will discuss uh, discuss odontogenic keratocyst right so since it's a developmental cyst it develops from the remnants of the dental lamina okay uh, which is scattered all uh, around in the jaws uh, as you are aware so the term odontogenic keratocyst was given by uh, someone called Philipson in the year 1956. I'll tell you a little more about its terminology uh, in due course. So this is a cyst as the term uh, clearly indicates. It's a cyst that produces keratin, right? So odontogenic, that means it is developmental from odontogenic epithelium and keratocyst clearly indicating that it's a cyst that produces keratin. Okay, so something very interesting about uh, OKC, okay, as it's abbreviated, the terminology of OKC. So, uh, in 1956, from 1956 to 2005, uh, odontogenic keratocyst was the term that was used to describe this, this lesion. But in 2005, when the WHO classified uh, odontogenic keratocyst as uh, not a not a cyst anymore but under the category of benign odontogenic tumor and this was done because of the unique behavior of uh, odontogenic uh, keratocyst which have, are, uh, have, are, are aggressive they have high recurrence they destroy a large amount of the of the uh, the the jaw tissue so considering all those factors as well as molecular factors that that uh, that research had identified it was recategorized from a cyst category to an odontogenic tumor category and the new term that was given was called KCOT which actually stands for keratocystic odontogenic tumor okay now uh, if you look at this fourth point i have gone ahead and can put a uh, couple of dots dot 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 and and the term okc so 10 years down the line as of 2015 when the who has re-evaluated you know as you are aware that every 10 years the who reassesses uh, tumors and comes up with a blue book and uh, which also includes new terminologies new classifications things like that and it's now once again uh, being accepted that the term odontogenic keratocyst is more preferred by pathologists all around the world and uh, as against the term KCOT. Okay, so we've gone back from uh, it being called KCOT to KCOT to now back to OKC. All right, so your take home message is that odontogenic keratocysts are still called odontogenic keratocysts. All right, and only between the period 2005 to around 2015, it was propagated that the term be used uh, was KCOT, that is keratocystic odontogenic tumor. Right? Okay, I hope this clears up and you understand. So, odontogenic keratocyst comes under developmental cyst and it is abbreviated okay, as so OKC. So, let's look at now the clinical features. So, this may occur at any age. Okay, they peak in second to third decade with. Uh, male predilection okay mandible is more common than maxilla okay in the mandible the ramus and the third molar area is more is the most common area followed by the first and second molar area and then the anterior mandible in the maxilla third molar area followed by the cuspid region is more common right so this is a very important uh, uh, feature that we should keep in mind because this will help you with coming up with differential diagnosis for radiolucencies in these specific areas okay so this lesion presents uh, as pain um, uh, sometimes with pain okay uh, soft tissue swelling sometimes expansion of bone uh, rarely and paresthesia of lip and teeth okay 
Now, radiological features of this lesion uh, is generally present as unilocular radiolucency with well-defined peripheral rim and scalloping borders, right? So, previously also I have explained that if there is a radiolucency with a well-defined rim and a scalloping border, it indicates that the lesion is growing slowly and destroying bone slowly, giving the surrounding normal bone sufficient amount of time to produce peripheral bone to try and stop the lesion from progressing. That is why we see this peripheral rim and scalloping borders. Okay, Large lesions are multilocular and something very peculiar in these cysts or in fact which differentiates this cyst from other cysts is its growth pattern. So these cysts actually grow in an anterior posterior direction Okay, as against other cysts such as radicular cysts and developmental cysts which generally tend to grow buccolingually. This is the reason why you see uh, why uh, these lesions uh, progress to, to, to damage a lot of bone uh, even before they are identified because what happens is the lesion grows anterior posteriorly destroying uh, large amounts of bone even before there is actual expansion of bone that is detected. Okay, So this is very peculiar of odontogenic keratocyst. So because this lesion is uh, is aggressive, it also leads to root resorption, displacement of neurovascular bundles, uh, and uh, is uh, is many a times associated with impacted teeth. Right. So some of the common differential diagnoses for impacted tooth radiolucencies: number one is dentigerosis, number two is OKC. Okay. Okay. So here is uh, a segment of an OPG where you can see an impacted eight. Here, okay, and there is a unilocular radiolucency here with a well defined rim and a scalloping border. Okay, so this, when uh, biopsy it turned out to be an auto. Now, this is a large multilocular radiolucency. You can see the extent, right? It's right from the uh, majority of uh, uh, the, the teeth, are, are uh, the majority of the jaw is edentulous here. There's an impacted tooth at the body of the mandible at the lower border of the mandible and there's a large uh, radiolucency here and the large radiolucency around here so this is a multilocular uh, radiolucency which turned out to be an odontogenic keratosis this is another example here of a patient with uh, a partially impacted tooth with a unilocular radiolucency and this radiolucency has actually uh, you know, uh, is 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 involving the lower bottle of the mandible, and uh, can very soon uh, lead to a pathological fracture. Right. Okay. So now that we know the clinical features and the radiological features, obviously the next step that we do in an investigation to come up with a confirmatory diagnosis is uh, to do a biopsy. Right. So when you do a biopsy, what do we find? Right. So these findings, the microscopic findings, are very characteristic, which help us to come up with the final diagnosis for odontogenic keratosis, right? So histopathologically, we see parakeratinized lining epithelium, which appears corrugated. So I'm going to show you a picture of how that looks. This lining epithelium is uh, around six to 10 cell layer thick, okay, usually. And uh, we see palisading basal cell arrangement, also called tombstone or pick and fence appearance. So palisading basically means parallelly arranged, parallel arrangement of basal cells. Okay, so this can actually be appreciated in the sense that when you look at uh, uh, the basal layer, you will actually notice if this is the basal layer, then you will actually notice that if these are basal cells, right? Let's imagine that these are basal cells, right? Tall columnar basal cells, then you are going to see the parallel arrangement of nuclei. This is what is meant by palisading. This is what is palisading arrangement of basal cells. Okay, this same thing is also equated to picket fence or tombstone because of the appearance of the arrangement of the basal cells. Okay, right. The next thing is that the epithelium connective tissue interface is weak in this uh, cyst, right? So, which means that uh, the epithelium very easily uh, rips off from the cyst wall, okay, which makes it actually difficult to enucleate if it's a large cyst, okay. And uh, if you do not actually, if you are not able to, if we are not able to enucleate it in total, 
uh, and the epithelial remnants are left behind, it will give rise to uh, newer cyst, thus increasing the risk of recurrence. Okay. Now these cysts, another risk factor in odontogenic keratosis is the Let formation show you of something so called this is a satellite the, cyst or if, uh, the uh, cyst lining, the, this is the cyst, cyst wall, wall or the connective tissue lumen. lumen. So this surface of the lining is has this ups and downs, this corrugated appearance, which is classical in odontogenic keratosis, and the lining is usually composed of parakeratinized epithelium as you can see which is 6 to 8 cell layered maximum and this arrangement of the basal cells which I described in my previous slide is called palisading arrangement of the basal cells again something classical in odontogenic keratosis right now this slide actually shows you a large cyst uh, with its lining here right this is the cyst lining this is the cyst lumen with the contents. So this contents here are filled with keratin and all of these structures that you are actually seeing in the cyst wall are basically satellite cysts and daughter cysts, right? So why are they called satellite cysts and daughter cysts? Well, because these are, uh, uh, these are numerous cysts that are seen in the cyst wall. Okay, so if this is the uh, main lesion, then these are um, the subsidiaries or, you know, satellites or, or daughter cysts. Now this is, uh, these the occurrence of these satellite cysts uh, is one of the important reasons why odontogenic keratosis actually show a 30% recurrence rate uh, because you know you cannot entirely remove them and there's always remnant that's left behind in the jaw giving rise to newer cyst right so two important reasons three important reasons why this cyst is very aggressive is number one the weak epithelial connective tissue junction which makes it difficult to remove in total, thus leaving behind uh, remnants of the epithelium which can give rise to new cysts. Second is the presence of daughter cysts in the cyst wall and third is the aggressive character of this cyst. Okay, okay this is another slide that uh, shows the, uh, the weak uh, uh, epithelial connective tissue junction. If you can see the epithelium is ripped apart from the cyst wall. So this is something very typical of uh, odontogenic keratosis or OKC okay okay so uh, what is the treatment the treatment for small cysts usually is surgical enucleation with chemical cautery if there's one solitary odontogenic keratosis well that's uh, something that can be done conservatively to try and contain it uh, enucleation is removal of the cyst in total Right, chemical cauterization basically involves a process called the use of a chemical called carnoy solution, which is a mixture of alcohol, chloroform, and glacial acetic acid and uh, ferric chloride, which is uh, which has proven to actually um, cauterize the remnants of the epithelium in the jaw, just pre thus preventing uh, recurrence. But again. It is, uh, we have different types of, I mean, they, we have uh, varied research reports that actually show the effectiveness of that. However, if we have large multiple cysts, the treatment is wide surgical excision that is practiced by 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 surgeons. Okay, that's because they these if there are large cysts, it's difficult to actually enucleate all of them in total. That's giving rise to, you know, uh, if you remove, just do just enucleation, then there will be high recurrence, making it difficult for the patient and thus affecting the overall prognosis. So as I mentioned, there's a high rate of recurrence up to 30% in these cases. And uh, so uh, that's, that's the problem with odontogenic keratosis. So patients with multiple OKCs uh, should be evaluated for something called as basal cell nevus syndrome or bifid rib syndrome, which we I will discuss in my next slide. What is basal cell nevus syndrome? Okay, it's also called Gorlin syndrome. It's also called Gorlin Gold syndrome or bifid rib syndrome. So what actually happens is, number one, this is an autosomal dominant uh, trait with a high penetrance. So the term high penetrance is indicated when uh, a gene defect actually, if present in any parent, has a very very high chance of of being transmitted from one generation to another generation. Right. So the word penetrance actually indicates the the uh, the penetration or the 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 expression of the gene. 
uh, from one generation to another generation. So the problem with basal cell nevus syndrome is that there is a genetic defect in the PTCH gene which is located on the loci 9q22.3 to q31. Okay, and if you if a patient has this defect, then it's an autosomal dominant uh, trait which will go down from one generation to another, another affecting uh, the offsprings that 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 uh, that come up. So, uh, what are the characteristics of basal cell nevus syndrome? Well, firstly, these patients have uh, multiple basal cell carcinomas on their skin. They have epidermal cysts, numerous epidermal cysts on their skin. They also have multiple odontogenic keratosis of the jaw. Uh, there's a, there, they show features such as plantar and palmar pits and calcified flax cerebri or dural folds. Okay. Now, various neoplasms or hematomas are also seen in these patients. They could be ovarian fibromas, medulloblastomas, lymphomacentric cysts, fetal rhabdomyomas, etc. And uh, various stigmata of maldevelopment are seen, particularly rib and vertebral abnormalities, uh, enlarged head circumference, uh, cleft lip and palate, or, or cleft lip or palate, and cortical defects of bone and other lesions. So these uh, lesions, many lesions are present, and uh, uh, literature actually mentions them, uh, categorizes them as major and minor criteria. And most of these patients who, who are diagnosed with basal cell uh, nevus syndrome are actually usually male, above 40 years of age, and uh, 75 to 80 percent of them have multiple OKCs. So many times the uh, oral healthcare professional could be the first person to actually be able to identify uh, this based on the, the the fact that you diagnose multiple odontogenic cysts. So basically, the important point here is if we have a patient who uh, we, we we identify multiple odontogenic keratosis, we must send these patients for further evaluation to identify if they have basal cell syndrome or uh, any word basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Right. So this is these are the features. So here this is a uh, photograph of a patient with uh, multiple epidermal cysts. This is how bifid rib looks like, right? So these, uh, so bifid rib actually is also seen in one to two percent of uh, the normal population. Uh, in fact, eighty percent of Samoans have, have been described to have bifid rib. But uh, bifid rib, in combination with all the other features that we've actually described before, uh, multiple odontogenic cysts, basal cell carcinomas, epidermal cysts, so on and so forth, uh, constitute two words syndrome which is called uh, basal cell nevoid syndrome okay so this is the uh, the the iops of the same patient that we i have just so far described so you're in this same patient we also saw multiple radiolucencies which when uh, biopsy turned out to be ontogenic keratosis thus we were able to uh, that uh, this case was diagnosed as uh, nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome right so uh, this brings us to the end of uh, today's lecture on odontogenic keratocyst and uh, uh, basal cell nevus syndrome. I hope you've understood. So to um, to move on, we I will be posting a case-based learning session on the uh, Google Classroom, which all of you will be expected to finish uh, according to the timeline. Okay. So the next lecture will cover. Uh, the la will be the last part in the series which will cover uh, radicular cyst, uh, lateral periodontal cyst and uh, nasolabial cyst. Okay.